Hey everyone, Drive to School podcast. I am Pastor Goodman and uh, David Zills fighting through allergies is, is joining us to champion the cause of apologetics. I, I'm afraid to ask how you're doing this morning, my friend. Uh, last week's been rough. Um, I'm hoping the temperature dropping will bring some relief here. Normally I love fall, but this one's been a little annoying. So I, I actually am ready for winter. Never thought I'd say that. I love snow. It's it's okay. Um, I hope you I hope you start to feel better soon. Though it's allergies are the worst. Mine hit in the spring, and uh, yeah, I just I sort of want to crawl into a, a hole and just sort of like bury myself. That's pretty much what I did last week. Good for you, man. I'm proud. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're gonna we're gonna tackle a controversial one today, aren't we? Yeah, I think so. I think uh, you know it's a it's a doozy. What do we got? So, you know, we've been talking a lot about the historical sources about Jesus. We talked about the New Testament, the Gospels. Have they been preserved through time by the copyists? Or did there get to be a lot of errors in the manuscripts we have today? We talked about the original authors. Do we know who they are? Were they trustworthy? Um, We've talked about other sources outside the Bible from non-Christian writers, early Christian writers, writers. We've talked about the the Apostle Paul and some of the Gnostic Gospels, and I think we've done a nice survey of a lot of the early first and second century sources that mention Jesus, and there's kind of a consistent theme is that Christianity was the same from the beginning. It didn't evolve over time. So if there's, and there's a lot of good reason to trust that the witnesses recorded in the Bible were telling the truth. And so if there's all this historical data to say, yeah, you should listen to what these guys say, then why is there so much skepticism toward the Bible, especially in the West? You know, a lot of people have heard about Jesus, but they know better. You know, they know that's a bunch of fairy tales. And so, you know, where, where does this like gut level knee-jerk reaction to, oh, well, that's just a bunch of hogwash come from. And I think there's a number of causes, but I think in our culture, after the scientific revolution, a big piece of it is there's some crazy stories in the Bible and scientific people who live in the age of space travel cannot believe in crazy things like people walking on water. Right. The, the miracles. Right. So uh, this is this is a tricky one, too, because, uh, I mean, they, they happened. Um, the, the scripture attests to it. We believe it. Uh, but they're, I don't know if they're harder to find today, but they absolutely are sort of harder to hold up to other people and say, look at this today. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I think there's stuff going on today that um, it's not necessarily talked about a lot, but there's a lot of reputable sources talking about modern miracles. And, um, you know, I had one coworker say to me during COVID, you know, as a scientifically minded person, I just can't believe some of the crazy miracle stories in the Bible. And I said, well, did you know that there are a lot of reputable sources documenting how this stuff still goes on today in response to Christian prayer? And his response to me was, well, if this is still happening today, then I guess it's reasonable it happened then. Um, Now, the converse is not true, that if it doesn't happen today, then it couldn't have happened then. That's a a logical fallacy. Um, But before we get into modern miracles, I think we'll have to save that for another discussion. Maybe this today we can talk about kind of the philosophy of miracles and just frame our thinking, because there's a lot of bad thinking surrounding the issue of miracles. And I want to get that out of the way before we dig into some of the exciting stories. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, so, I mean, maybe even just from the, the get-go, like, um, I, I guess I've always sort of defined miracles as uh, God working inside of creation in a way that that kind of defies what sin should break. Um, that, that God works in his creation in a way that that keeps something going in the way that that it, it, it almost defies a, a little bit of reason and logic because we break a lot of stuff down here. And so when God works miracles, it, it's him preserving his creation through through various ways. I think uh, I think that's a good definition. So yeah, I think starting with definitions is key because when people say the word miracles, they can mean all sorts of things. And so I like that definition. Um, some other definitions, and I think they're all compatible and kind of talk about the same thing. Another definition that's a little more um, philosophical or scientific is that a miracle is an anomalous event 
that is supernaturally caused. And so there are three parts to that. First, it's an event. It really happened. So we throw out things that are myth, um, you know, certain things about Hercules. You know, we throw out the myths. We throw about things that are fraud. Certainly there are a lot of miracle workers today who probably are not legitimate and we don't count those cases and then we throw away cases of misunderstanding where maybe because of someone's theology they say well i still have my symptoms but i know god's healed me and i just have to work out my faith you know and so you know those kinds of things where we something hasn't actually happened those aren't miracles it has to happen but then you know what happened the second part is it's anomalous it's not something that normally happens. And so if it could have been a coincidence, it's not a miracle. It has to be something that kind of defies statistics. And then the third part is it's supernaturally caused. And so this is where, as you were saying, God is working on his creation to preserve order over and against the effects of sin. And so it's not something that, you know, just happened because we can provide a scientific explanation. There's something where there had to be a supernatural agent um, who intervened in the course of events to change the outcome. And so um, that supernatural agent could be God. You know, we can talk about the possibility of counterfeit miracles. You know, I think we see those in the Bible, you know, for example, Pharaoh's magicians in the, in the story of the Exodus. Um, but, you know, that that's a starting definition for miracles, an ev anomalous event, a strange event that's caused by a supernatural agent. Um, Another um, another theological, less philosophical definition is more along the lines of what you said, which is special divine action. So we talk about, you know, in the catechism about divine providence and how God daily takes care of all of our needs of body and soul. And so while those might be actions of God through the normal course of events, we're not talking about those as miracles. We're talking about something where God intervenes and does something different from the normal course of events for whatever reasons he has. Right, but he, he even kind of lays these these reasons out, and I think they might be important. That that uh, the, the signs happen because God is merciful and loving. See, he he performs these miracles out of mercy over and over again throughout the scriptures. It is it's mercy that drives him to do this. It's it's love for for us. Uh, it's not to prove that he's real. Um, in, in fact, the the word is for that 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 he would call us by the gospel. Um, and when we sort of keep these two things in the in their right corners, we can understand that that the miracles are simply you have a loving God who wants to take care of you and. And his word teaches you about who he is. Uh, so the scriptures would say the Jews demand signs and the, the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. So it, it doesn't sort of deny that there are miracles when we preach Christ crucified, but it, it sort of keeps the miracles in their place. What if God was real and actually loved us? Well, then he'd probably be taking care of us down here. It, it's not to sort of prove to us that he's real. Uh, the, the resurrection from the dead is for that, but, but rather uh, it, it's simply the sort of well, if he actually does love us, then you'll see bits and pieces of that sometimes. Yeah, and I think part of God's love, too, is sometimes getting people's attention. So as I've been reading, um, I have a whole set of my bookshelf over here on miracle books. But as I've been reading about this, um, it's interesting that when the gospel is being preached in territories where Jesus hasn't been heard of before, um, oftentimes miracles will accompany that along with mass conversion. So it's kind of like God, similar to how he did in the book of Acts saying, hey, listen to this guy. He's got an important message for you. But then it's the word that's preached through the missionaries that is actually the catalyst for the conversion. But the miracles are kind of like, whoa, I should maybe hear what that guy has to say. Right. And if you're a Lutheran and want to kind of go for a deep dive here, uh, we recognize that enthusiasm is the, the idea that we would sort of measure God by, by our hearts or by sort of the things going on around us instead of by his word. And we don't like that. That's bad. Um, but at the same time, uh, Chemnitz talks about the, the difference between immediate call and an immediate call, a call through means uh, and a call apart from means. So when God works through the church, we know it's a church, the, the church is established. And so we listen to the preacher because the church has put him there. But where there is a, a call apart from means, where there is sort of the, the church, the prophets, for example, would be a great example of this. Uh, the prophets' words are both in line with the rest of scriptures and also accompanied by signs. Um, this is something that, that's not abnormal, but in fact, the way things have always been. And so when there is not a church to, to sort of call, yeah, we, we can't deny the possibility 
of miracles. We just, we don't want to measure God's existence solely by them. We also want the word. And so we were going to hold these things in kind of attention, right? Sure. Sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I think this is all good theological discussion to kind of frame the concept of a miracle. What's, what are we talking about? What's the definition? Um, so then the question is, you know, well, you defined it, that doesn't make it real. And we still come back to this objection that, you know, in a scientific world, you know, I think science has disproved the possi possibility of miracles. So I want to talk about three questions that are kind of you know, get at the philosophical, is is this crazy talk or is or could there possibly be more to this? And the three questions are, are miracles possible, which is one question. Next, are miracles plausible, which is a question we care about more. And then finally, are miracles reasonable? Could it ever be rational to believe that a miracle has actually happened and not just that it's a possibility like a pink unicorn? Um, so, um, so first let's start with our miracles possible, you know, a lot of people would say science has disproved the possibility of miracles, but I think that's actually not the case. I think if anything, modern science has indirectly made the case that miracles are at least possible. And what I mean by that is, um, it's been said, if God, then miracles. So in other words, if there is a creator of all things, then the creator certainly has the ability and the right to intervene in his creation any way he likes. Um, you know, so if, if there's a creator that created water molecules and, and grape plants, then there's a God who can turn water into wine. If there's a creator who invented gravity, then that creator can suspend the laws of gravity and walk on water. If there's a creator that invented human biology, then he can work healing miraculously in ways that go counter to the natural course of events. And so the idea is, if there is a creator, then miracles are possible. So then the question is, do we have a case for a creator? And I think modern science has actually laid out a, a enormous amount of evidence that this universe is designed. And it's not just me saying this, but there are prominent um, prominent thinkers who are in the, the public spotlight who have written about their experience of conversion from atheism or agnosticism or something to Christianity and how the scientific evidence played a role in that. Awesome. So um, if there is such a thing as God, then yeah, the idea, unless he's sort of abandoned us, that, that he would still be working here, like his motives aren't changing, it, it, at least if we, we follow the scriptures, there, there's a, a reasonable case then to to look for the possibility of miracles. Yeah, yeah. And so so some examples of some of these prominent intellectuals who, you know, who have made the case for a creator from science. So Francis Collins, he led the mapping of the human genome. So kind of, you know, not, not a small, uh, small game scientist. And then he was the director of the National Institutes of Health until last year. And he founded a ministry called BioLogos. And if you go to their website, there's a short little video where he kind of tells his story about how he started out as an atheist, um, but then started to look at evidence And because he, re he realized he came to his conclusion about the most important question, does God exist, without looking at evidence, and that was counter to his profession as a scientist. So he started looking at evidence, historical, scientific, and he came to believe that Christianity is real. And he wrote a book called The Language of God, where he makes a case for a creator from design in the universe. And he's a biologist. So I think a lot of that has to do with genetics. Hugh Ross is an astrophysicist. Um, he started out agnostic and, you know, looked at the scientific theories and said, it seems like the universe had a beginning. You know, we may debate what the beginning of the universe looked like, but it seems that it had a beginning. And that seems to imply that it had a first cause that's outside of nature and is personal. And then he decided to investigate the different holy books and see which one best described the origin and makeup of the universe and came to the conclusion that the Bible was accurate in a way that couldn't have been um, invented by humans. Um, he wrote a book called Design to the Core, where he talks about design in the universe, fine-tuning of the solar system, of the physical constants, all these things that are just the way they need to be for life and us to exist. 
And then one last example, Antony Flew um, was an extremely influential atheist philosopher. Um, so not a scientist, but a philosopher. And for decades, you know, he sat with C.S. Lewis back in the day um, when C.S. Lewis was holding meetings at Oxford. And um, in the last 20 years, uh, he actually has died now, but shortly before his death, he converted to deism, the belief that there's a God, but doesn't, God doesn't intervene. And that had to do with philosophical issues around suffering and evil. Um, but he believed that there was a creator because, for example, the theory of evolution assumes you have life reproducing that can then evolve. It doesn't, there, there's still this huge hole for how we got life. Mm -hmm. In, to begin with, and Anthony Flew believed that modern science has made that hole bigger and bigger over time as we find out more about, for example, DNA and things like that. And so, you know, we as Lutherans, we, we talk a lot about six days and evolution, and these are important discussions because we want to take scripture seriously and inerrancy and faithful interpretation. But if we zoom out from that question to the bigger question of, is there a creator at all? You know, I think you know, there's a there's definitely a case that can be made from science that there's a creator. And if God, then miracles are possible. Right. That makes sense. So then are miracles plausible? Yeah. So, you know, anything's possible. Like I said, you know, pink unicorns are possible. That doesn't mean that, uh, you know, I expect to see one. And so I think there are a couple, I think there are two questions that, um, that matter when you're thinking about the plausibility of miracles. And the first is context. Um, so C.S. Lewis kind of talks about miracles from the standpoint of God as an author of a story. And he says, it, are, is the miracle claim happening in a context that makes sense where the author would want to interject a, a miracle into the story? And so, you know, for to be concrete, you know, people talk about Elvis sightings. And so, you know, at some point we'll talk about the resurrection of Jesus and the appearance of Jesus. So, you know, can we make a case from Elvis sightings for the resurrection of Elvis from the dead? And first of all, the evidence is very different in those cases. But from a purely um, storytelling perspective, there isn't a narrative about Elvis coming back from the dead to make sense of that event. It's just a weird bizarre thing that makes no sense. But if God became a man, which is the Christian claim about Jesus, then we would expect that that man would have certain abilities that were not natural. Um, and so there's, there's the miracles and resurrection of Jesus fit in a storyline where we could say, okay, if a miracle was going to happen, that would be the place where it would happen. And so it's not just a weird fluke like an Elvis sighting. Fair enough. So um, how do we how do we start to figure out then for for Christianity, where we might want to look for this? Yeah, so I think, um, I think, you know, miracles, a lot of times function as signs, they're, they're not, it's not about the miracle, it's it, the miracle is pointing to something other than itself. And so for Jesus, the signs are pointing to the fact that the kingdom of God is coming. You know, Jesus said, if by the finger of God, I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. And so it's a sign that God is doing something very special in the person of Jesus. Um, you know, God can use miracles as signs to get people's attention when there's missionaries going out into places where there is no church yet. Um, they can serve as signs where God just touches someone out of love because, like you said, he's merciful and he wants to communicate love and purpose to someone in a special circumstance and might respond to prayer miraculously. And so I think there are cases where it has to be in line with kind of the story of scripture. And we want to test everything against scripture, but there are cases, I think, where in the storyline you would expect God, if, if the storyline is true, to do something miraculous. Awesome. So then is it rational to, to believe in a miracle? Yeah. So, you know, maybe, maybe it makes sense in a story, but there are a lot of nice stories. You know, I, I you know, I, I kind of like Lord of the Rings myself, you know, it, it makes for a great story, but it doesn't make it real. And so um, there's, there's this idea, you know, David Hume is a philosopher from the enlightenment that did a lot of faulty reasoning to disprove miracles, then people still point to him today, even though his arguments weren't particularly good. 
Um, but one of the, the common lines you'll hear is, is it more likely that a witness is wrong or that the laws of nature have been violated? So it's kind of like a, a gotcha question. It's like, are you serious? You're going to believe a witness, even though witnesses are notoriously unreliable over the, the uniform experience of mankind is often how it's phrased. And so the problem is, um, speaking from my background in my PhD on statistics, this is actually confusing two things here. Um, and in statistical jargon, we're talking about prior probabilities and posterior probabilities. And in everyday language, what that basically means is it's what am I likely to believe before looking at the evidence? And what am I likely to believe after looking at the evidence? And so the claim that, you know, witnesses are notoriously unreliable, that's not talking about a particular witness whom we've evaluated with evidence. That's just a blanket statement. So that's what I'm likely to believe before looking at evidence, you know. And so, and so let me illustrate this principle. So for example, if someone told you they won the lottery, before you look at any evidence, what are the odds that any given person won the lottery? Yeah, one in umpteen million or... Yeah, not very high. But if they give you evidence, maybe they show you a ticket that has the number that was called off that day. And maybe they have a large, maybe they go around all of a sudden making large purchases that they would have never made before. You know, okay. now all of a sudden we have evidence. We might say, even though my prior probability, my belief before evidence was low, based on the evidence, now I realize, okay, this might be reasonable. And so this is this comes up a lot in statistics. It's, it's a field of statistics called Bayesian statistics. And basically, there's all, it's almost always possible in principle to obtain enough evidence to overturn even the most unbelievable odds. And so the key is, you got to look at the evidence. And so maybe another example, you know, someone's got to win the lottery. So maybe that's not a good example. But, you know, let's talk about aliens. If your best friend said, hey, aliens have invaded the planet, you know, unless you're a weird conspiracy theorist, you know, you'd probably be like, uh, you, you're messing with me. Like, what's going on here? Um, and because your prior expectation, your belief before evidence is low that aliens would invade or even exist, possibly. But if you start to have evidence, maybe there's newsreels showing spaceships, maybe there's reports from your neighbors about weird stuff happening and green goblins popping out of the corn, you know, I mean, to borrow from a movie, um, you know, maybe the president comes on live TV and says, yeah, we've been invaded by aliens. We're mobilizing the military, blah, 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 blah. You're going to need Will Smith. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. So, so. The idea is the bottom line is for our miracles rational, so much misunderstanding happens because we say that could never happen when it's possible, or I could never believe that, but you've never actually looked at the evidence. And so the key, the bottom line is you got to look at the evidence because that can change everything. Right. Fair enough. So then how do we start to, to deal this, with this as, as Christians who are willing to sort of recognize that we believe this because the scriptures attest, but, but how do we start to measure it then in, in reality? Yeah. So I think, first of all, you know, you have to look at the credibility of the witnesses, which we've talked a lot about. Um, are, the, are the people recording these events reliable witnesses? And what it basically comes down to, and I think we could spend a whole session on this, is how do you test hypotheses? So you've got some data. So and so wrote down that such and such happened. Okay, that's data. You know, how do I test different hypotheses? Maybe it never happened because they were lying. Maybe it never happened because it was alleged. Maybe it never happened because their senses deceived them and they were hallucinating. And you basically test different hypotheses. And then through process of elimination, I think there are several instances in the New Testament where the data the only hypothesis that fits the data is the one that the New Testament itself is saying. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll probably have to talk a little bit about the process of reasoning from data to hypotheses, but it basically is a process of elimination game. You know, at first, all hypotheses are on the table, and then eventually you find data that contradicts them one by one until ideally at the end of the day, only one is left. And I think we can do that certainly with the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and so, 
you know, if that if that's the case, I think you can say that there might be enough evidence to overturn our prior expectation that these things don't just happen. Fair enough. That's that's a lot to kind of chew on, uh, David. Let's let's kind of wrap things up here, and then we'll come back around to it next time. What do you think? Sounds great. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope the allergies go away and uh, you can enjoy <laughs> fall while it's still here. <laughs> Me too. Thank you.